Hi everyone! I am so excited to start our exploration of European history today. Now before we really dive into the information, I want to give you all a little tip for understanding it, and that is to praise Europe. Now what does that mean? Well, praise is actually an acronym standing for political, religious, artistic, intellectual, social, and economic. So these are essentially the six ways we will look at European history at each time. The birth rate in the 1850s or the political structure of 1700s France. But the key to really understanding European history is to recognize how all of these factors ended up influencing each other and how that changed over time. So today we'll be studying the art of the Renaissance. So I want you to consider how art factored into society as a whole at the time. If any of these other five factors influenced it, hint, they all did. And as we move forward, consider how the role and style of the art we see today changes. Now, there were two main renaissances going on in Europe at the time. In Italy, centered around Florence and Venice, and the low countries of the north, the modern day Netherlands, Belgium, and Luxembourg. Now, in both cases, there was just an explosion of new art and new artistic technique. And while the art of the two places ended up looking very different, the reason behind this proliferation was very much the same. The word Renaissance actually comes from a Latin verb meaning to be reborn. Now, the Renaissance followed what was arguably the worst couple of centuries ever in Europe, it was marked by very destabilizing events, like the Great Western Schism, which physically split the church into two pieces, the Greek Orthodox and the Roman Catholic, and left many people very shaken in their faith in God. And of course, the Black Death bubonic plague, which ravaged European cities and by some estimates left one third of the population of Europe dead. The Renaissance marked a period of relative stability, and with that stability, many people felt a desire to return to the previous glory of the continent, which many historians agree ended with the fall of the Western Roman Empire. So let's begin by analyzing how this return of sorts showed up in Italian art. There were three primary characteristics. Artists attempted to emulate Greco-Roman works. Fewer religious images were created, instead many subjects were actually secular, and artists really embraced realism and recognizable imagery. This was the Renaissance at its most literal. Italy returning to its ancient roots, Renaissance artists had a fascination with both the style and the subject matter of ancient pieces. Ancient Greeks and Romans loved to depict the ideal human body form. Here's the Venus de Milo on the left, a Greek marble sculpture that portrays the ideal Greek woman. So contrast that with Michelangelo's David from the Renaissance. These two were sculpted nearly 1600 years apart, but due to their proportions and stance, look like they could have been created at the same time. Standing next to each other, they represent the ideal Greek woman and man. And like I said, this fascination extended to subject matter as well. This is Botticelli's Birth of Venus, celebrating the Roman goddess of beauty. Many pieces were actually very obvious about what they were celebrating and their desire to return to the classical ideal of sorts. This is Raphael's School of Athens, which places many of the most famous thinkers from the ancient Greek world in one room together. This fascination with the past meant that religious imagery, which during the medieval period was essentially the only thing celebrated in art, was not nearly as prevalent as it once was. In the medieval period, a lot of art looked something like this. It was an icon, or a depiction of a holy figure, in this case, Madonna holding the baby Jesus. And I mean, this made sense because medieval life, by and large, revolved entirely around the church. People lived simple, devout lives, sometimes subjected themselves to suffering even, so that they could gain a beautiful afterlife. Beauty on this earth was not nearly as important. But like we discussed, there were many issues during this time. And because of the issues with the church, the issues with disease, many people were dying. 
a lot of people's faith in religion and in God was pretty shaken. In art, this had two significant impacts. First, art really de-emphasized religious imagery, essentially a declaration that if God wasn't going to save the people on earth from death, they wouldn't celebrate him as much. This piece, for example, arguably one of the most famous pieces of art ever, Da Vinci's Mona Lisa, celebrates a normal Italian woman in the countryside without any overtly religious elements to it. The second impact actually dealt with how art was made and consumed. After the struggles of the medieval period, very wealthy people began to take pleasure in the beauty of earth and appreciate art for its aesthetic value, which led to the rise of art patrons. These were people like the wealthy banking family from Florence, the Medicis. They paid famous artists to create works of art. Now, much of the time they were portraits, but one of the most famous examples is the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, commissioned by Medici Pope and painted by Michelangelo. So now for the final characteristic of Italian Renaissance art. In order to understand how important this new wave of realism was to art, let's bring back that photo of Madonna and Child from the medieval times. So this piece is very flat to the eye, no movement, and uses a pretty dull color scheme. Zooming in a bit, we can see that essentially every person in this piece has the same facial expression, and baby Jesus has the same face as the Madonna, but shrunken and stuck to a tiny body. For many of the reasons that life became more secular, artists invented new techniques to portray the beauty of real humans and the real world. This included point perspective, which added dimension and movement to pieces. Here's an example in Masaccio's Holy Trinity. Now, zooming in a little bit, we can see how our eye and all of the individual perspectives in the piece are drawn to one point, specifically Jesus' navel. Another technique was sfumato, in which artists blended lines and colors, producing very soft figures that gradually led into one another. Take a look at the Mona Lisa again, and specifically her jawline, how it's shadowed and how her jawline blends right into her hair. Lastly, Renaissance painters utilized a technique called chiaro oscuro, which contrasted light and dark imagery in an attempt to render fuller and more three-dimensional images. This is Titian's sacred and profane love, and as you can see, compared to the dark imagery behind her, the very light woman looks well-defined and three-dimensional with that contrast between the light and dark. Altogether, these three characteristics made art into something more aesthetic, into something more intellectual, rather than simply serving as a means to depict a religious image. So now let's move up north to the Low Countries and the Northern Renaissance. The Northern Renaissance shared an important characteristic with the Italians. Realism, in both subject matter and technique, arguably even more than the Italians. The northern painters popularized oil painting, which led to very colorful, vibrant pieces of art. Take for example Jan van Eyck's wedding portrait, featuring a normal scene of a rural couple in their home. Northern painters also emphasized the role of the natural world in daily life, seen here represented by a dog. As you can see, this painting features very precise and very careful detail that attempted to capture the scene as accurately as possible. For the same reason that Italians turned to secularism, the northern painters turned to what was known as religious mysticism, which stressed that religion was about an individual's connection with God rather than something based in a church. This concept actually ended up foreshadowing the Protestant Reformation in the same area. Look at the Marode altarpiece by Campan. It portrays a woman having a religious experience, in this case reading the Bible, with the embodiment of the spiritual world, the angel Gabriel, right by her side. The Renaissance really set in motion an artistic revolution and reflected many of the themes that had begun to characterize society in general. These are in no way isolated, and we'll continue to see these factors at play for centuries to come. Thank you guys so much for watching today. Be sure to review your key terms and concepts at the end of this video, and I'll see you next time.